This is Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Mark. And heavy metal veteran Jack Starr is our guest today. He's been playing heavy metal and hard rock guitar since the 70s. He talks about moving to the U.S. from France when he was a kid, and he tells me the best TV shows to watch to learn English. When the music bug hit him as a student, he didn't start off on guitar, though. He began his journey as a drummer. But he discovered that he wasn't coordinate enough to be a drummer. So he shifted his focus to guitar. And by the time he was in his teens, he was gigging in clubs. He founded the seminal heavy metal band Virgin Steel, but two albums into that band, he left to start a new one, Burning Star. After several albums, Jack went a different direction and Burning Star went on hiatus. But in the early 2000s, he revived the band and they've been going strong ever since. They've signed to a new label, Global Rock Records, who are not only re-releasing his entire Burning Star catalog, but releasing a brand new Burning Star album called Souls of the Innocent. Pick it up if you like riff-filled metal guitar. And follow Jack Starr's Burning Star on social media for more information. Follow us at Performance ANX on social media, and you can show us a little love with a cup of coffee on ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety, or with some merch at performanceanx.threadless.com. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with metal legend Jack Starr on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Jack Starr. You're listening to Performance Anxiety with Mark Shea, and uh, we're keeping the rock alive. Thank you for hopping on with me. This is great. My pleasure. And you might be hearing my dogs growling in the background. I don't know what's going on. I hope the somebody. Dog is... <laughs> I hope somebody shuts the dogs up, please. The dog's getting into it. They, he, he knows the real deal. They do. They're, they're metal dogs. All right. So what I like kind of go into your past a little bit to kind of, I guess, figure out a little bit about how you got to where you are now. So you're born in France. That is correct. Yeah. I was born in France. Uh, my dad was over there for the big uh, World War II. Okay. And he stayed on. He didn't want to go home. He stayed another 15 years. Wow. Then I came along, and then when he was finally ready, him and my mom, we uh, moved to America. Uh, but, you know, technically, I was kind of both nationalities. Okay. But I did have to learn English when I was like 10 years old. Oh, wow. So you were that old when you moved out. Yeah. and wow. uh, But I was helped by Gilligan's Island and Bewitched and I Dream of Genie. They were really great sources of English language learning. <laughs> oh man, I never thought of them in that sense. <laughs> That's pretty wild. So was there a lot of music in the house or was there uh, something that got you interested in music as a kid? Not really. Uh, I mean, my mom liked music and she dabbled on a couple of instruments like piano and violin and singing. But really, there wasn't really a whole lot of music in my house. Um, oh. I just got bitten by the bug when I saw these bands, you know, like Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and the Rolling Stones. And I figured, you know, I just wanted to make music and... Uh, Maybe, you know, meet girls on the way. Maybe Makes that sense. was part of it. You know? <laughs> but really, it was it was really more about music, you know. How old were you when you... I, well, I guess before we get into that, was guitar the first instrument that you picked up or was there something else? Actually, there was something else. It's funny you should ask. I did try to be a drummer first. Oh, wow. And um, I wasn't coordinated enough. My sense of rhythm wasn't good enough. And... <laughs> It was just really too difficult. It was really hard to, to be a good drummer. Yeah. So after about a year, I just gave it up and I said, I can't do this. I'm going to uh, stick to guitar. Oh, wow. <laughs> How long before you started uh, playing in, other, in bands and, and gigging? Uh, you know, it, it came relatively quickly, you know, uh, by like, I would say by like 19, by the mid 70s, you know, I was... I was a young kid, but I was already playing. I was already, you know, playing in clubs. Uh, wow. Opening up sometimes for national bands. Like, 
I think one of the first shows we did, we opened up for Blue Oyster Cult. Oh, wow. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a great band. And uh, I don't even think they were called Blue Oyster Cult. They were just about ready to change their name from Soft White Underbelly to Blue Oyster Cult. That's and, really, yeah. uh, we And we played with them and uh, got to meet them. You know, Gutapa was a very nice guy. Buck Dharma. Yeah. Actually, his real name was Don... Don Rosner, I think is yeah. his real name. Yes. Anyway, Don showed me how to play Whole Lot of Love, which I still play his way today. Oh, that is awesome. Years. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Hey, guys, I've got some great news. Performance Anxiety and Pantheon Podcasts are giving away an exclusive VIP experience to see Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets. So head to pantheonpodcast.com slash Nick Mason to enter. Find the link in the show description or head over to our Twitter, Facebook, at, or Nick Mason's Facebook page for the link to enter to win. Head over to pantheonpodcast.com backslash Nick Mason to enter. Find the link in the show description or head over to our Twitter, Facebook, or Nick Mason's Facebook page for the link to enter to win front row seat upgrades a very special commemorative guitar pick shaped necklace carved down from a drum cymbal played by Nick Mason himself. You also get a selection of curated exclusive VIP merchandise, including a VIP laminate and lanyard, crowd free shopping at a dedicated merchandise stand before the show and on-site perks such as priority check-in VIP express lane into the venue for ease of entry and a dedicated customer service line. Nick will be playing in my area at the Lincoln theater in DC on September 27th. And I'd love to meet up with a DC winner at the show. So enter now at pantheonpodcast.com backslash Nick Mason. Winners will be notified via email one week prior to the event. So enter now. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with the stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Try doing that in person. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And a special offer to Performance Anxiety listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash performanceanxiety. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash performance anxiety. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. But it's all good. We're getting a little, little bit of a buffering. We have some pretty rough weather here earlier, and I, th I think my internet oh, is still okay. a little funny. When did you form uh, Virgin Steel? And, and how did you guys, what were you listening to? Because that band is really innovative for, the, for 82, you know, especially in the U.S. <laughs> Well, we were uh, influenced by a lot of what was going on in Britain at the time. Uh, okay. I was uh, reading, you know, these English rock magazines and newspapers. Uh, there was one in particular called New Musical Express. Yeah. There was another one called Sounds. And they were always like talking about Iron Maiden, Saxon, Budgie, Angel Witch, all these bands that nobody in America ever heard of. You know, and so 
it kind of perked my curiosity. I wanted to hear them. And so I made it a, you know, a point to find their albums and find the music and listen to it. And, um, it was just something I could relate to because, you know, being born in Europe and everything, it, it made a, a big stamp on my playing, you know, all the music that I listened to in my youth. And I found an affinity with these bands from Europe. And uh, so when I started uh, Virgin Steel in 81, my idea was I wanted to, uh, I wanted the band to actually sound like a European band. And it wasn't because I had anything against American music or anything. I loved it. You know, I loved Motown and I loved a lot of the stuff that was happening. It was just something that I could feel inside of me. I was more comfortable with it. Right. Yeah. And that's the great thing about music is it, it all touches people differently. Yeah, exactly. And we all re respond to it differently. Yeah. And, uh, and it's all, it, it's all good. You know, yeah. it really is because it's a beautiful thing to be making music. It doesn't matter what kind of music you're making or who your influences are. It's just the mere fact that you're being creative and you're doing something that is really one of the most beautiful things that as humans we do. Yeah. I mean, the whole concept of music is just so incredible. It is. It's amazing. It's, it's, yeah. So you founded the band, but after two albums and an EP, you left. What what happened? Yeah. Well, there was a, you know, there was a parting of the ways and uh, we, you know, different people sometimes go in different directions, you know, okay. and uh, sometimes it's for the better because I really was looking for a more guitar dominated, guitar driven kind of thing. And I think Dave, who was, you know, the other kind of uh the other alpha male in that band <laughs> right. you know the other leader or whatever you want to call it i think he was looking for something a little more progressive and uh i was looking i don't know i had different influences you know yeah. uh, sometimes though we did agree obviously because we we made two albums right underneath <laughs> so there was but it did reach a point you know where it it just wasn't really feasible anymore. And uh, so we went our separate ways and, uh, you know, I've always wished, you know, Dave the best, you know, yeah. and he kept the, he kept the name going and he kept, he kept his vision of what it should be. And uh, for that, I say, you know, great. You know, I stuck my vision and I made a solo album and I went off on that. I made a solo album, got, got a recording deal with uh, Passport Record, which was a big label back then. I right, found yeah. another single, uh, Red Forester. <laughs> riot and i thought he had just an incredible voice and then i started doing burning star albums you know well, with uh some great musicians that live on long island where i'm from including a, a really great young singer named mike torelli i think he was like i don't know maybe 19 or 20 you know wow. when we started working uh, I'm like 10 years older. So, you know, there was like a difference and, uh, and Mike, uh, just fit like a glove. You know, he, he was very influenced by Ronnie James Dio and mm -hmm. he could, uh, he could pull it off. He could really <laughs> sound convincing so much so that, uh, the first time I actually heard him, we went, we went to a club to hear him play and we pulled into the parking lot and I thought they were playing, uh, uh a Dio album. Oh, and wow. we walked in. When we walked in, we realized it was this young guy <laughs> singing named Mike Torelli with his band. So uh, 
It was a pretty cool thing. That's awesome. And I was, all right, so I was checking out your, your discography and f- from 83 to 85, I, it seems like you didn't sleep because you're in, <laughs> <laughs> you're in Virgin Steel, Devil Child, which I thought was amazing. That was a bit more extreme than, than uh, Virgin Steel, but... Burning Star, Phantom Lord, Thrashers. You had solo album come out. Did you rest at all in those couple of years? I had a lot of music that I wanted to get out. Yeah. <laughs> and I did that. And I was fortunate enough, you know, to find record labels that like what I was doing. And I got to explore music a little bit. I didn't confine myself just like previously. I didn't want to confine myself to just Virgin Steel. I also didn't even want to confine myself to just burning star. So I did these, these side projects, Phantom War, Devil Child and, and others. And, um, ironically, Ned Maloney played on some of those and, um, and Ned, when he was like, I don't know, like 21 years old, he also played on the very first solo album that I did called out of the darkness. Yeah. Here we are, you know, it's like a hundred years later and Ned and I are still playing together. <laughs> We're not kids anymore. Though Ned kind of still looks like a kid. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't seem to age at all, you know? And he plays great. You know? yeah. He's, and he and on this new album, Souls of the Innocent, what's really beautiful about it is that Ned has really become a really strong collaborator like all the songs on the album pretty much are co-written between me and him oh okay and uh there's even one really that uh i don't even know if i have any credit on on the album i'd have to look at it but i he pretty much wrote the whole thing it's wow. called it's called ships in the night <laughs> really become like my favorite song on the new album it's just it's just unbelievable he uh he or he put some uh some strings on it cellos violins and it's just it's just kind of like taking our band to another level and um i listen to it you know i have to like pinch myself you know wow this is really us and (laughs) and uh and everything works you know blends together beautifully like I remember at first on that particular song, I was playing a solo that was actually reminiscent of Stevie Ray Vaughan. And I'm thinking, this is incredible because it's really fitting into this epic metal song. Yeah. And then Ned asked me to make it a little bit less bluesy. Okay. And I was able to do that, taking out certain notes, certain with certain notes, like in the Mixlodian scale or mm-hmm. the uh, Aeolian scale, you know, scales that are more more commonly like associated with metal yeah so i did that and you know what i actually ended up liking it better (laughs) you know and these guys and i'm not just ned but rhino the drummer who's an unbelievable drummer i mean i'm so fortunate to be able to have him in the band oh yeah Uh, he's one of my favorite drummers uh and the other 
drummers, you know, like Tommy Aldridge, and Cozy Powell, and the late, great Eric Carr. Yeah. Uh, the late, great, uh, the drummer that was in Billy Squire, uh, Bobby Chunard. Oh, okay. you know, these are all guys that just hit so hard that you feel it. And actually, you know what? The drummer that's in Riot right now is a phenomenal drummer also. Oh, okay. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Hey guys, I want to talk to you about socks for a second. Why not? It's a music podcast. But I tried a pair of socks from Boldfoot and love them. I've only worn them once because my kids have stolen them. So in my household, that's the best endorsement I can give. And I guess it's fitting because the design I chose was jailbait. Wait, jailbird. The design I chose was jailbird. I might keep that in. The socks are 100% American made and 5% of all proceeds go to veteran charities. It makes sense seeing that Boldfoot is a family and veteran owned company. They have a huge variety of styles. So check out boldfoot.com and buy some of the best socks you've ever slapped on your feet and help veterans while you're at it. That's boldfoot.com. So, so there's a lot of really great drummers out there, you know, just shake the walls when they play. Yeah. And uh, Rhino is one of them, you know. Okay, so you mentioned the, the bluesier solo that you were doing. You have delved into the blues a bit in the past. So like Burning Star was active for a bunch of years, but then Strider came out in 91, which sounded a, a lot bluesier. Also came out with a solo album. you know, the Jack star blues band. Have you always been into the blues? Is that something that you've always wanted to do or was it something new when you started to play blues here? No, that was actually my main thing when I started playing was, was blues. Okay. Um, it wasn't so much, you know, hard rock or metal, but then I discovered that there were a lot of, you know, metal guys and hard rock guys that also felt the same way I did, you know, yeah. like, uh, like Mick Rouse, who was in Mata Hoople, then later uh, started the band Bad Company, which was really a hard rock band, Bad Company. And uh, but a guy that was really rooted in blues. So then I started thinking, you know, it's really not such a, a leap to go from blues to hard rock to metal. As long as you play with passion, uh, you get the point across, you know. Yeah. I mean, Hendrix was an incredible blues guitar player. People don't realize it. So I did go back and listen to a bunch of the stuff, and I really do like the Swimming in Dirty Water album. That is really good. I, I love the, the the bar blues sound to it. It's it's uh, yeah. It's it's really just a classic sound. Yeah, you know that was uh, you know I'm I'm living in been living in Florida the last eighteen years, so it's rubbed off <laughs> in a good way. You know, and there's a lot of Southern rock here. In fact, yeah. uh, I think that maybe Southern rock actually was kind of invented in Florida. I mean, you know, bands like Leonard Skinner and Molly Hatchet and uh, 
a lot of, you know, there seems to be a lot of it coming from Florida. And um, so when I was uh, here, I couldn't help but get into it. And I started really enjoying it. And uh, the album that you mentioned, Swimming in Dirty Water, really has that kind of uh, hatchet meets, uh, you know, the almonds meets Leonard Skinner sound to it. And, and so um, and it's a lot of guitar on that album. Oh, yeah. And uh, all the stuff that I do is is guitar heavy. Oh, yeah. Well, it makes sense. <laughs> it's what I do. Yeah. I'm yeah. not saying it's good, but there's a lot of guitar. Oh. <laughs> Be weird if you came out with an album of drum solos. Yeah. So. Well, well, I, yeah. <laughs> what made you resurrect Burning Star? Was it back in 2009? Was that when the first day? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was really in 2006. Okay. Um, it was basically... Ned, Star, Ned and I, the bass player of Burning Star, Ned Maloney, we started playing again in the early 2000s. And um, we had been playing, you know, in the 80s. So it was great to get together with Ned and start playing with him again. Yeah. And um, we were going to do an album called Guardians of the Flame because all of a sudden the internet had opened up, metal was getting. And people remember this guy named Jack started playing guitar. And it was like, hey, whatever happened to that guy? You know? yeah. Is he still playing? You know, blah, blah, blah. And then I finally got on the internet myself. There was a, some really good uh, goodwill in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And that a lot of people, you know, kind of wanted to hear me play again. So um, we put the band back together, you know, like that old, uh, you know, cliche. <laughs> yeah. Let's get the band back together. Right. You know? <laughs> And uh, we call the album Guardians of the Fame. And uh, the name of the al- the name of the uh, we call the group Guardians of the Fame. The name of the album is called Under a Savage Sky. And then later on, when I got together with Joey DeMaio, who was the uh, bass player of Man of War, and he, he started a record label called Magic Circle. I don't know. Anyway, we were talking, and he said, you know, why'd you call your band Guardians of the Flame? You don't, you know, why don't you just call it Burning Star, like, like the new album that we're going to be putting out on Magic Circle? And then I said, you know, I don't know. I guess I wanted something different. And and Joey just told me, he just said, listen, you created a lot of goodwill with the name Burning Star in the 1980s, mm-hmm. you know, with the uh, Rock the American Way album, the Blaze of Glory album, the No Turning Back album, uh, the Orange album. They're all Burning Star albums. So why not go back to that, you know? Makes sense. You, well, stick with it and in the back of my mind i was like you know you know this guy's making sense you know you yeah. know he's joey's no dummy no <laughs> so uh so now we flash forward to uh 2022 and um uh, i you know burning star signs with global rock records yeah great new label from europe from england which was recommended to me by carl kennedy the drummer for you know the iconic band the rods yeah and uh, and anyway he said you know there's this these group this group of people they're putting together this label you know this might be something cool for you to contact them and see you know what they think so anyway to make a long story short yeah i contacted them i spoke to uh brian adams the the ceo of that label and I met Giles Lavery, who I had known previously uh, from actually having recorded uh, a guitar track with his band when he lived in Australia. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was pretty cool, you know. And um, he remembered me, and I remembered him, of course. And, you know, we had just nothing but about each other. And, uh, and anyway, I signed with them, Burning Star, and me and Ned, and we just said, you know, 
this is a good thing. Let's let's go with this label. Let's go with Giles Lavery as our manager. And uh, one thing led to another. And then Giles said, you know, we're interested in the whole catalog, all the Burning Star stuff that you've done, reissuing it. Wow. And at that time, I kind of, you know, said to Giles, well, you know, there's something in the back. We did this album in, you know, in 2006. And it wasn't called the Burning Star album, but it really should have been called the Burning Star album. Ned played on it. You know, we came up with a lot of the riffs and arranged it and everything. And 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 I told him, you know, what Joey DeMaio had told me yeah. you know, years before. Why the hell are you calling it Guardians of the Flame? That's got nothing to do with anything. Yeah. It's a burning star album. Yeah. And uh, so I said, you know, would that be okay, you know, if you change the name of the album? And he said, yeah. He goes, that's a good idea. And, okay, so once I got the green light from Giles, I said, you know, there's another album that me and Mike Torelli did. And for some inexplicable reason, we called that one Strider. Right. Would that be cool if we make that a Burning Star album too? And, uh, and off the whole output of Burning Star and albums when uh, Souls of the Innocent comes out. Wow. And he said, yeah, it simplifies everything in terms yeah. of, you know, the, the fans that are out there. What they care about a lot is the fact that, you know, Jack Star is on it, Ned Maloney's on it, you know, and that it has that Burning Star sound. And in exactly. the case of Strider, Mike Torelli was on it who had already sung on on three other Burning Star albums in the 80s. So the new album, it's uh, the same band, but a new singer. So you have Alex Panza singing. That guy's vocals are insane. They're pretty insane, you know. I don't know where I find these people, but <laughs> I can't take total I can't take total credit for that one. We had uh, we had some help. It took it took Ned Myself and Rhino, like, I don't know, like two and a half, three years to find a singer. Oh, and, wow. um, and uh, we knew uh, there were some big shoes to fill. I mean, the person in the hall that had sung on the three previous Burning Star albums is a phenomenal singer. Yeah. He's, you know, he's a force of nature. Uh, if uh, Boston needed a singer, if Styx needed a singer, if Mario needed a singer. He's got the range. Oh, yeah. He's got the power. And he's got great stage presence. You know, what more does any band want? Right. In our delusional little minds, we're thinking, we need to find someone on that level. And basically, <laughs> it was, well, good luck with that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so we, uh, we kind of just kept that. Um, and then we heard this guy, uh, Alex, we, you know, we were, like, wow, this guy, this guy's got it. And then we found out influences were in band. Uh, Red Forrester, the, the my first solo album, who right. had been in Riot, he um, was one of the influences. And Red, for me, was really like such an iconic, incredible singer, you know? Yeah. And to hear this young guy who was like only 29 years old, you know, we all could be his father. We're all to <laughs> say that. <laughs> So anyway, that's how it worked out, you know, and it was great, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he fits the song so well. Now, is he writing his own lyrics or is you guys providing lyrics for him? Uh, we, we wrote and myself and, um, and Ned, you know, I got to give him credit, right? Had a lot of Skype phone calls working on the app because like a lot of foreign born singers, they're going to sing with a, you know, with a slight accent and we wanted to make sure that the lyrics were as understandable as they could be. Yeah. You know, not that that's always bad to sing with a slight accent, you know? Right. You know, you know, like, you know, you have like loudness from Japan. Are you familiar with them? Oh yeah. You know, you have the, the singer, you know, rock and roll crazy nights. You know, he's got that. It doesn't sound English guy singing, but right. it sounds cool as hell. Yeah. Loudness. Same thing with like, uh, you know, the scorpions, you know? Especially on the early album. As time went by, Klaus Meine just sounds more and more American, you know? Yeah, for sure. But back then, you know, he, he had a definite uh, a definite accent, you know, German accent. Oh, absolutely. You know, and uh, it was cool. You know, I, I loved it. So anyway, that said, and I'm like a total hypocrite right now because <laughs> we worked for like... 
and Ned worked for like a year trying to minimize that accent, but I just went off <laughs> saying how great I thought it was. <laughs> oh, that's okay. it was it was so great that that we tried to get rid of it. But, <laughs> but anyway, it's all it's all good because bottom line is he's a great singer and uh Ned did an incredible job working with him, you know, on pronunciation. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, he's holding up his own, you know, and uh, like I said, he had to, he had the very unenviable role of singing on a burning after Todd Michael Hall, yeah. after Mike Torelli, after after Frank Vestry, who did Rock the American Way, after right. Rhett Forster, after Shmulek Avigal, who did the uh, Burning Star Six, which was called Under a Savage Sky. So he had this incredible, it was almost like a, uh, the working for it was almost like a challenge, you know? Yeah. It was like, okay, let's see if you can hold, hold up next to these guys. So in my opinion, you know, some of the best, uh, metal singers. and also let's go David DeFay in the mix too. He had to also follow David DeFay's yeah. shoes from uh, Virgin Steel. So all these incredible singers that came before him, and here's this 29 year old guy from tour in Italy throwing the gauntlet out and say, okay, Alex, sing. The fire that you speak of has already burned. Reminds us of what was was, condemned with no return. Through that denialies, beyond the mountains, was left to spoken. asking you to sound better than these guys because that would probably be impossible right we're asking you to be in that same ballpark and uh that's what we went for and i think he i think he does okay i think think he nails it i mean what do you think i think he nails it because i love demons behind me road to hell A river of blood right. they just oh man they're they're just awesome awesome performances yeah the kid can sing no doubt about it and uh you know my feeling is it's a very specific art the art of heavy metal singing uh not everyone can do it i even tried doing it you know just i wanted to see what it was like yeah you have to have that power and it comes from the core. You either have it or you don't. Robert Plant had it 40 years ago, you know, when yeah. he was singing, you know, Communication Breakdown, and, you know, and uh, the Immigrant Song, you know, come starting the song off with that incredible scream, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. So it's not an easy thing. No. It definitely, definitely has it, you know, he can do it. He can do it and uh, God bless him. And really somebody, we had an angel on our shoulder because <laughs> we needed a singer like him. Yeah. Especially after Todd Michael Hall, who was just killing it, you know. Yeah. He was so good. I mean, he got on The Voice, a, na- uh, a national television show seen by, I don't know, 100 million people. Yeah. So oh, man. You can't, you can't be a slouch to get on there and to, and to get on there, you know, twice. You know, I mean, he was, he was going pretty far in the, uh, in the hierarchy of that show, like little steps you take. You know, oh, like, yeah. Uh, where can people find the album and how can they follow the band and see what, uh, if, if you, when you guys ride on the road? Yes. Okay. It's going to be available on all the uh, digital platforms, you know, like all of them, you know, like whatever they are, Spotify. Or, uh, I don't even know the names of half of them because right. I'm old and I, <laughs> I don't keep up with a lot of stuff, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> 
it's also going to be available in a physical form. Awesome. And uh, people should definitely look for it. The name of the band is Jack Star. The name of the album is Souls of the Innocent. And also to get a preview of you know what this album sounds like, go on YouTube and uh, type in Jack Star's Burning Star, and you'll see the two newest songs from the album, which are Demons Behind Me and Souls of the Innocent. Leave a nice comment. Uh, what's the uh, social media? Is it uh, Jack Star's Burning Star? Uh, fit, yes, Jack Star's Burning Star, uh, and also Jack Star, which is my my page, and uh, also Global Rock Records, Excellent. which is the uh, the website for the uh, record company. Perfect. Ja- and one more, yeah, Giles Lavery, our manager, also has a Facebook page, so you can go on that and keep abreast of what's new in the world of Burning Star and his other signings, which are all great, like Chris and Pelletieri, Alcatraz, uh, Girls' School, uh, a lot of really great talent. Yeah.